in my head wish it was happiness instead but like the monster in my bed its eyes are glowing red and it's telling me that i am nothing good but what is new hello everybody and by everybody i mean anybody who uh, stumbles across this vod this stream the podcast Maybe snip it wherever it might be. Let's get into today's show. I can't even tell you what it's going to be about. Uh, it's been a tremendously long day for our meetings and whatnot here in hometown. Let's get going, though. That's right. I no longer do intro music or anything like that even on the podcast or the stream here or over on youtube nothing i am as naked as can be and by that i mean i'm fully dressed and uh oh i don't have my lights on i'll just turn those on how about that so anyway my name is mayor watt and i am the mayor of hometown that is hometown right there well way up there what is hometown news aggregation site helps me manage the onslaught of news that comes at me every day because i consume about 200 sources of information throughout the day and i use that in my daily life i sound like legally blonde there i use legal jargon in my well anyway I aggregate all of this stuff into hometown.com and it became a thing and showed it to a few people and they dug it. So I opened it up to everybody and now I'm doing a show and uh, I'm evaluating uh, what additional shows that I'm going to bring to the table starting in January. And um, I had a four hour meeting (laughs) about that recently. And I've got about five shows that I would like to bring that would start after the hometown daily news show. I would have another hour show right after. Um, and, uh, we just go from there because I have 50 shows that I actually want to bring to uh, Twitch and to hometown. And if you are interested in being a host or co-host, get in touch. We can chat about it and figure something out. I mean, I have a plan, but. The best laid plans, you know how it goes. Well, the first article and and today, because of the way things worked, I'm going to actually have to click on the visit the source link. Normally I have it all set up, but we'll do it. We'll do it live. The first article is in the word in tech. Elon Musk's Twitter blue with verification is now live. Apparently it's back. But I don't know about that. Um, According to the article over at The Verge, um, yeah, in the last 24 hours, it went went active again, but it's only available on iOS for now. Maybe by the time this hits you, um, it's everywhere. The new Twitter Blue, which now costs $8 a month and gets you a blue verified checkmark, which basically means I have eight bucks a month to spend on Twitter. Um, It is officially available in its app for iPhones and iPads. Began hyping the new Blue just days after taking over the uh, company at the end of October, promising features like verification, priority and replies, mentions and search, and half as many ads. Half as many ads! So apparently, uh, Twitter was successful enough that $8 a month was half of the return on or i should say the revenue generated by uh, ads so uh, depending on where you are and and what the service is it's somewhere around five dollars a month ten dollars a month you know i'm just like kind of throwing numbers out there because it really depends on the service but apparently twitter's valuation for each person is sixteen dollars a month that is how much money they make on the ads. 
Otherwise, they would, like the rest of this, priority and reply. If everybody is verified, then everybody is getting priority of replies, mentions, search, blah, blah, blah. This is literally pay to play. So if you have eight bucks a month and you pay that, congratulations, you're actually worth $16 um, a month in ad revenue. We'll see what happens. There's more to this article, but it says on the sign up form on iOS, the $8 a month price is pos uh, positioned as a limited time offer. For the moment, you can't sign up on the web. You have to sign up on iOS. And some users already subscribed to Blue are reporting they have to subscribe again, specifically to the new tier if they had already done it. So should I do that? Should I pay $8 a month to do something on Twitter? Right. Just upgraded to the new. This is Jane Mansion Wong as their check. Woo woo. Just upgraded to the new Twitter blue. Now my new $8 blue verification badge replaces my old blue verification badge, which looks identical. That's right, folks. What once was free is now $8. This screams the same thing that happened with uh, the free services that were offered by Google. For 10 years, the uh, service, basically office apps, um, was free. And then they pivoted that and said, screw you guys. Well, the next article which basically says screw you guys too, is over in the word in tech. Binance won't bail out FTX, cites reports of mishandled customer funds. This is something that I talked about yesterday. Um, and crypto is kind of taking a beating. Uh, when I last saw it, it was at um, 15,900. It's currently sitting at i think it's climbed back out of the hole to 17,800 i'm rounding it uh, meanwhile the stock market has bounced back up to uh, well 1200 plus i think it was i'm not sure um i don't have the direct number in front of me i'm actually looking at futures now but yeah um money is being made folks if you have it and you play your cards right and have no full information out there anyway binance the largest crypto exchange by volume says it isn't buying the beleaguered ftx crypto exchange saying that the issues are beyond their control or ability to help according to the company statement the statement also said that news reports regarding mishandled customer funds and alleged u.s agency violations <laughs> led them to back out of the deal which was announced yesterday. Basically, the building is burning down and there is no water. Um, oh, let me back up. The uh, first article, the one about uh, Elon Musk's Twitter blue verification is now live, which is actually uh, Twitter blue again, um, was written by Jay Peters over at The Verge. And this new article, this one about Binance not bailing out FTX is uh, written by Mitchell Clark and Elizabeth Lopato. So yeah, there's this uh, huge, huge issue with crypto in that FTX is going to implode. Sam Bankman Freed, I guess is their last name, uh, tweeted that Binance has shown time and again that they are committed to a more decentralized global economy while working to improve industry relations with regulators. We are in the best of hands. And... He hasn't tweeted today, so at least not at the time of my awareness. <laughs> Maybe he has, and I've just been busy for the last five hours, which is true. Well, he wants to raise $8 billion to cover all of the withdrawals people are trying to make from FTX. As far as I know, there is no FDIC insurance, so all of this attempt well, it may not all be there for everybody, so good luck. 
He's warned investors that FTX may be facing bankruptcy if he can't raise cash, which is certainly possible. The real problem is that all of the people that have been maybe doing some money there, like in it stored anywhere, guess what? They may not get it if they're not fast enough. The people who are most likely to get hurt if FTX folds are its customers. The FDIC has specifically said crypto stored or invested in FTX isn't covered by the protections afforded by regular banks. Wow. In a tweet yesterday, Zhao summed up where he believes FTX went wrong. Exchanges should never use their own tokens as collateral and they should have large reserves set aside instead of using their capital in uh, capital efficiently. Well, it's not efficient if the risk is so high that you implode. Also, FDIC has regulations wherein the liquidity of the reserves are in place. Certain amounts are required. So if a bank run is actually in progress, there is some level of risk mitigation to showing overtly, oh hell, we are in deep trouble because when a bank or other institution pops up out of the woodwork and says, holy hell, we are in trouble. There's a bank run. We might implode. Guess what happens? Everybody wants their money even faster. It says here, uh, one extremely gnarly possibility laid out by Matt Levine in Bloomberg is that FTX loaned its sister company, Alameda Research. Uh, some money and accepted FTT as collateral on the loan. Worries about that possibility, even if it's not the reality, may have sparked a bank run. And this is what crypto is really all about. Every institution that's wrapping itself around crypto is leveraging the crypto and leveraging the leveraging of the crypto. And that is really, really bad for business. I don't know if everything is working here because um, it certainly seems like I'm dropping a lot of frames and I really don't like that. Everything else has stopped, so I'm not sure what's going on. Anyway, every once in a while I have a bad connection with Twitch. The next article is in the mobile channel, Copper, uh, Copper a Clue in the Fight Against Cancer. For cancer cells to grow and spread around the human body, they need proteins that bind copper ions. New research has said uh, about how cancer related proteins bind the metal and how they interact with other proteins opens up new potential for new drugs in the fight to cancer or for against cancer. Um, in a, a paper over at fizz or an article over at fizz.org um, titled Copper a Clue in the Fight Against Cancer, it's by Chalmers University of Technology. Human cells need small amounts of metal copper to be able to carry out vital biological processes and iron and other things, actually. Uh, studies have shown that the level of copper in tumor cells in blood serum from cancer patients is elevated, and the conclusion is that cancer cells need more copper than healthy cells. Higher levels of copper also mean more active copper binding proteins. Therefore, these proteins are highly important to study when it comes to understanding the development of cancer and deeper knowledge about them can lead to new targets for treatment of the disease. Quite fascinating, right? Most cancer related deaths are due to the fact that metastases, secondary tumors form in several places in the body. For example, in the liver or lungs, a protein called MIMO1 is part of the signaling systems that cancer cells use to grow and spread around the body. Previous research has shown that when the gene for MIMO1 is inactivated in breast cancer cells, their ability to form metastases decreases. And there's actually, um, from the research that I have done, uh, I'm sorry, the research that I have read, um, there's actually kind of a beacon broadcast, chemical broadcast um, from the primary um, cancer mass. This is something that I read a long time ago and then it, read it again. Um, and for full disclosure, I am not a, a cancer researcher. I'm involved only because my wife has breast cancer. And um, in fact, well, I won't go into that. But anyway, um, 
And uh, I would love to be able to find a solution. And the only solution that I find is scrubbing blood, not just can. Not, the, the problem here is that finding the masses aren't necessarily possible. And if you excise one cleanly, chemo and radiation is necessary to kind of destroy whatever might still remain. Um, and chemo is just so destructive to the entire human body. We just happen to be resilient enough that we can recover from it. Um, and uh, so finding some way and cancers are very personal, you know, they're unique to each individual. So the treatment sometimes is different other than chemo and radiation, which is you know, typically applied when someone has cancer. Um, finding something that is targeted would be brilliant. And um, you know, I have this idea of um, scrubbing blood to remove the uh, free floating tumor cells. There are little fragments of tumor cells that float around and can rebind. So it says here, we saw how copper ions could transfer between the proteins MIMO1 and ATOX1 in test tubes. And when we looked in breast cancer cells, we found the two proteins were close to each other in space. And based on this, we conclude that the exchange of copper between these proteins can take place in cancer cells as well as the test tubes and thus be of biological relevance. I wonder if they could actually um, destroy the cancer cells, maybe trigger apoptosis and um, they kind of just blow up and hopefully uh, don't survive in any form. They can't rebind or anything. I'm not sure. Um, but it's quite quite interesting that discoveries are still being made. Um, and if you can, uh, support cancer research by donating to various funds. I have no real connection to any, um, but find one in your locality and donate. If I can find one, and they agree to actually let me represent them in some way, um, then uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll put it here on the stream. I'll talk about it um, and make it an opportunity where you can donate. Uh, I just don't I don't want to represent anybody without their authorization. So um, this next article is over in the Reality Hacker. I am very interested in uh, virtual reality. I've got. Uh, Pico 4 coming. I should have bought the Pro, but it didn't come out until after I bought the original Pico uh, 4. It's on its way, but I want the commercial one. Uh, it has cameras facing in and, and better hand tracking, apparently. Anyway, Pimax Portal is a hybrid VR headset with a Nintendo style handheld at its core, Pimax. The China-based creator is known for its fleet of uh, large FOV v PC VR headsets, announced a new product in its lineup that set, that's set to straddle a number of devices uh, classes thanks to its convertibility between a Nintendo-style handheld and a snap-in VR headset display replete with six degrees of freedom for tracking. This is spectacular cult portal Pimax is first pitching the device via a Kickstarter campaign in what it calls a global pre-sale event starting November 15th. Well, guess who's going to jump on that following the recently announced Pimax crystal portal is the company's second standalone VR headset with an onboard processor, a Qualcomm Snapdragon XR2. And it's slated to take the company's VR centric product line in a drastically different direction. I think the, Pimax ones are really bulky though, if I remember right. Pardon me, let me need to move my window a little bit. Anyway, roadtovr.com is the source of this. Scott Hayden is the author of the article and uh, they go into greater detail. And it says Pimax is offering two fundamental flavors for its portal handheld sans headset, which uh, looks a bit like a cross between a Nintendo Switch and a Steam Deck, a standard version price at three hundred dollars for one hundred and twenty-eight, and for two fifty-six, you get you, you shell out four hundred dollars. Not bad. And a version of the QLED display price at five 
$550, promising a 5.5 inch HDR screen with 4K resolution and 144 refresh rate. That's pretty nice. So when does it become, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. Ta -da. So what you do is you snap it into the headset, break off the controllers, slide them into tracking handhelds and off you go to VR world. And it appears to be entirely wireless. Sign me up. I'll go take a look after the stream. Um, unless somebody's in my chat and wants to chat. <laughs> uh, so what's going to happen if I do that, by the way, is I'm going to stop the stream and restart it. So I have a different recording. Um, but at any rate, I will update the voting area over at hometown dot, um, uh, showbot.tv. Sorry for the delay. My brain is trying to get back on track. Like I said, I had an extremely long meeting and then I had a conversation that really <laughs> uh, sidelined me. So at any rate, the next article is over in the law nerd channel, which is all about law and law tech lawyer flubs allowed politico to access law professors election litigation emails so how did politico obtain a law professor's election litigation emails it began when a lawyer failed to deactivate a dropbox link that was created to share said documents the aba journal wrote this article and deborah kasson's wife my hero over at aba journal i've never met them and i don't have any idea uh uh, about them other than their name but i love the way they write and uh anyway i'll leave it right there not knowing that the link was still active the general counsel for the u.s house of representatives included the link in attachments to a brief that was filed with the ninth u.s circuit court of appeals at san francisco reported uh, politico and the new republic and the link was created for lawyer or by lawyers for former chapman university law professor john eastman whose emails were sought by the committee, explained House General Counsel Douglas N. Letter. So, did something to the letter. Uh, uh, ha, ha, ha. In a November 2 letter filed with the Ninth Circuit, quote, we were not aware that the links in Dr. Eastman's email remained active and had no intention to provide this type of public access to the materials at this stage. Providing public access to, to this material at this point was purely inadvertent on our part. Yes. So there's a reason why I had um, customers. <laughs> I've, I've, one of my uh, businesses was um, focused on providing consulting, tech consulting in particular to attorneys. And that's because there's a lot of them that just don't have a real grip on tech. So if you want to, I've been thinking about <laughs> reigniting that engine because this is what I see even at high levels of litigation where you would think that everybody is pretty damn tech savvy. Let's move on to the next article. The next article is in the word in tech. LG's stretchable prototype display could attach to skin, clothing, and furniture. Announced in a press release on Thursday, the stretchable display has a resolution of 100 PPI pixels per inch and is capable of displaying full RGB. Cool. The prototype was uh, created using micro LEDs with a sub 40 uh, micron uh, pixel pitch uh, that were built into a silicon substrate typically used in contact lenses. According to LG Display, it gives it a consistency similar to that of a rubber band and allows it to be stretched. Interestingly enough, I watched the formulation of conductive silicone. Um, and uh, I think that would be, I wonder if that's where it ended up. I don't think so, but I don't think, right? There's a difference between silicon and silicone. Anyway, um, 
So yeah, it's kind of stretchy tech. That's pretty awesome. You know what this would be awesome for? A rollable OLED TV. And that's what they mentioned right there. I think that is what I want. What I want is I, I want a phone that I can just roll the screen out, just grab one end and pull it out and it locks into place. And preferably it, it locks into a place solid and, and, and doesn't twist and all of that kind of stuff, but then I can roll it back in. But I want it so flexible that if I do something like that, that's on the screen right now where it's very flexible and very rubbery, um, it doesn't break. So stretchable displays are not only thin and light, but also can be uh, attached to curved surfaces such as skin, clothing, furniture, LG said. I think this would be great. Obviously it's a prototype, um, but it says here LG Display isn't the only company exploring stretchable displays. Samsung has previously showcased the viability of the tech in real world applications after creating a stretchable OLED screen and a prototype heart rate monitor back in June 2021. They actually provide a link to that over at The Verge. I'm not going to follow it. No, I'm going to tease you into going over there because uh, I want you to do some of this with me. I want you to go and find neat articles and then come back and talk to me. Come back and talk to Marwat about neat articles that you find. You can even submit them. If you hit exclamation point S and then the URL, they'll be submitted over to uh, Showbot. I will parse them and find them suitable for a particular episode. Really would appreciate it. Um, if you can submit them to Ometown, that would be great, right? So I'm working on that. I had it operational at one point, but I stopped um, due to some complexity in the processing of it. Uh, my Ometown is not <laughs> your standard build of, it is a WordPress site, but it's not your standard build. At any rate, I have some custom code in there processing a bunch of information. Let's move on to the next article. I hope that you are interested in all of this let me know the next article is over in the mobile channel um, i'm actually working on something um, as a separate project um, called mobile and uh, i'll be announcing it sometime maybe the first or second quarter first half of uh, 2023 police use dna phenotyping to limit pool of suspects to 15,000 in Queensland Australia, Queensland, Australia, police have used DNA phenotyping for the first time ever in hopes of leading to a breakthrough in a 1982 murder. The department uh, partnered with U.S.-based company called the Parabon Nano Labs to create a profile image of the murder suspect, a Caucasian man with long blonde hair. Police claim that the image was generated using blood samples found at the scene of the murder of a man from 40 years ago. And according to the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, this is the first time investigative genetic genealogy has been used in Queensland. I can't decide if this is absolutely freaking amazing or if it's dystopian to the point that I don't like it. But... 15,000 linked individuals and they have not been able to find a close match yet. So this says here, and I'll just, I'll quote the whole thing. The Queensland police department said that the DNA sample from the case generated a genealogy tree of 15,000 linked individuals, and they have not been able to find a close match yet. This is an article over at vice.com by Chloe Zhang. I think that's how they pronounce their name. Please let me know if it's not. Um, but I think it's really interesting. It, they actually have this in a, a section called this series explores um, surveillance and its intersection with race and civil rights. And they put a period, but then they didn't capitalize the word made possible with support from Columbia University's Ira A. Lip, Lipman Center. And they have this little graphic of an eye that says uh, state of surveillance. That's kind of neat. Uh, yeah, uh, the whole world is kind of in a state of surveillance, if not the uh, high tech version of it in China and other places. Uh, you know, the UK has its own surveillance. 
uh, all over our cameras and here domestically in the United States, we have surveillance all over the place to the point where Ring is partnering with law enforcement to extend videos with or without the population's permission. I'm not quite sure, probably without. Maybe they've accepted it in the terms of service. Maybe not. I'm not quite sure. Um, in fact, maybe I can do some due diligence and verify if that actually is part of their terms of service. But we have cameras all over the place. We have ring cameras all over the place. Uh, I know that my doorbell is a different doorbell than ring, but it's recording stuff 24 hours a day, seven days a week and can reach all the way down the street and, uh, this way and that way. I mean, it's just kind of amazing. And um, interestingly enough, depending on where you are, it's people surveilling other people. It isn't corporations. It isn't tech. It's people surveilling people. Oh, you're not like me, so I'm going to have to watch you. And if you violate something that I don't agree with, then I'll have to do something. Uh, write a sternly worded letter um, or flatten your tires. It really runs a pretty broad gamut. Um, but Surveillance is both high tech and societal. And if you want to stop surveillance in certain places, it's up to you to make that determination. You know, um, we can change, we can be the change we want to see in the world. So these DNA databases raise questions about privacy violations of DNA phenotyping, though Mallet encourages people to voluntarily submit other samples to free DNA researching sites. Um, oh, sorry, submit their DNA to help police investigations. Many users who submit their samples to free DNA researching sites may not fully understand how their data will be used. True. Now, this is a different type of surveillance DNA, but just like fingerprints and other things, if somebody picks it up off of the street by dusting a, a, a glass for prints and then storing it and suddenly a crime is committed and they submit it to the police and they wonder where it came from well as long as there's a it's not directly used maybe they can actually get it from the public as well i mean there is so much here that can lead to a dystopian world in fact if you've ever watched gattaca the movie gattaca um which is made up of the elements of DNA um, what's really interesting there is um, uh, basically the society is just obsessed with genetic purity and not necessarily you know the, the same way that like Nazi Germany was obsessed about <laughs> racial purity but genetic purity it's a different animal subtle but <laughs> not so subtle at the same time and so this person kissed somebody else and went over to a genetic testing facility and they swabbed her mouth and uh, gets a printout right away that this person is this or not this and uh, or worth the investment of committing to a relationship and having children. You had to be perfect. That's what it was. So go check out Gattaca. Maybe I'll watch it and uh, part of the uh, continuity report we'll we'll talk about it here on the stream maybe i can do a, a podcast um, episode for the continuity report as part of um town because uh, if you go over to uh, any podcatcher and do a search for um town you'll find me anyway be careful where you put your dna folks <laughs> Uh, you may, you may, may be implicated in a crime, so don't do it. So the last article for today is in the Warcrafters channel and it's called the best open world games. Um, I am a big fan of open world games. I just bought, um, one, what was it called? It's not actually completely open world. Sorry. I'm pulling up my, my steam album here, my steam library. Um, against the storm it's pretty neat it's not really open world but it has such 
a, a nice, nice flavor to it. It feels like it's open world because you have to expand and build your base. It's, it's pretty awesome. I really dig it. But this is an article that talks about open world games. Open world just keeps getting bigger and better. With each year comes more games that immerse us in dramatic scenery, long quests. That's what I really love. A whole long storyline where I follow a quest and a quest and a quest and a quest. Old school World of Warcraft kept me so busy. Um, nowadays it was nowadays it's pretty much just grind your butt to end game real fast. Don't really enjoy or care about anything. And some people who get triggered by that will say, well, I remember the whole story. All right. And, and yeah, I'm sure you enjoyed it and blah, blah, blah. But all the objective is now is to get to that end game and then get kudos that you completed the boss here or boss there or whatever. But I just wanted to hang out with people and go through all of the quests uh, grindy or not. At any rate, this article uh, is titled Best Open World Games, and it's over at PC Gamer. Um, Imogen, or Imogen um, Meller, M-E-L-L-O-R, wrote this article. It has contributions from Andy Kelly and Samuel Roberts and Stephen Mesner. Um, and yeah, I'm going to go through some of them, not all of them. Again, I encourage you to follow the link that's going to be over in... Uh, uh, Showbot, so you're gonna have to go to hometown.showbot.tv and uh, click the links and go check out the this article as well. Uh, one of the article uh, subjects is Elden Ring and Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I don't know, uh, a lot of these aren't so much open world as in as they are. Um, you have to follow it this way. Um, but Elden Ring is huge. Assassin's Creed is great. It's a lot of fun to watch. Uh, Death Stranding is disturbing and fascinating and awesome all in one. Um, I certainly uh, dig that game. Red Dead Redemption 2 um, is open world for sure. And you can just go wandering off. Marvel Spider-Man, and again, it's kind of encapsulated. Uh, Subnautica, you can go wherever you want, really. You don't have to follow a particular storyline, but if you don't follow the storyline, then you won't get all of the stuff you need um, to advance really fast. Uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. Um, again, it's one of those things you have to follow that storyline. You can't really go off the reservation. You can, but again, you can't advance. Grand Theft Auto is completely open world. If you wanted to follow a storyline, go for it, but you can really go bananas in GTA. The first one that I think is like truly open world in this list so far is Elder Scrolls um, Skyrim. Uh, I just, I dig Skyrim. Um, played it off and on, but uh, usually what happens is I go completely off the rails in some other direction and then i can't find my storyline but whatever king kingdom come uh deliverance i have not played it it's as buggy as it may be kingdom come deliverance is an open world rpg slash immersive sim whose ambition outpaces its problems most of the time that's what the authors say uh, not only is the small slice of medieval Bohemia beautifully rendered, but it's a complex and loosely historical simulation of life and death there too. I might have to go and check that out. Cyberpunk 2077 has so many quests that I lost track of everything. I, I basically, imagine highlighting a document about things that you find interesting and the document is so interesting that it's nothing but one massive highlighted sheet of paper. That's 20, uh, Cyberpunk 2077. Uh, Dying Light is awesome. Dying Light 2, Forza Horizon 5 is a racing game. Um, I don't know how you can really get open world so much in that, but yeah, it does that. I've played it. Um, PC Gamer gave Forza Horizon 5 the medal of best open world in 2021, which means it naturally deserves a spot in this list, according to the authors. I don't know about that. Forza 4's interpretation of the great 
of Great Britain was good, sure, but come on, Mexico's natural diversity is just a little more interesting to drive through. Instead of endless fields and hills, you get to race through ancient temples. A bit disrespectful, sure, but immensely fun. This is all stuff fun read from the authors, so go check that out over at PCGamer.com. Again, the link will be in the uh, show notes wherever uh, you are getting this, as well as um, hometown.showbot.tv. Uh, Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl. Um, I have not played it. I've watched people play it. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. That is a hugely open world adventure game. Metal Gear Solid 5. I've never played. Uh, Euro Truck Simulator 2. Uh, they're simulators, so you're kind of stuck in the map, but you can drive wherever you want to. So I suppose that's open world. Just Cause 2 is... Uh, also, uh, it's an island game, and so you're kind of stuck there, but it is open world. Has a lot of stuff that you can do. Mad Max, Flight Simulator, Saints Row 4, Dwarf Fortress. Uh, they compared it to Minecraft. I don't know about that. <laughs> I guess in its generation... Minecraft is ultimately open world. Um, there's things about Minecraft that kind of drive me nuts, like the lack of gravity, realistic gravity in any way. Like, uh, obviously you have to draw the line somewhere, right? I guess. Um, but Minecraft getting a tree at its roots and it just hovers there drives me a little bonkers. But that's okay. It's a great game. I've played it so often. Uh, I can't count how many hours I've been in there. Number of servers that I've spun up and deleted. Oh my gosh, so many. Anyway, Mojang or Mo Yang. I've heard people say both now. I'm just going to say Mojang from now on because that's what the developers were saying during the last Minecraft event. All right, I am done for the day. It's a little bit short of, an, of a stream today. Uh, only 45 minutes, but I don't have much soapboxing to to really do. No rants. Um, Marwat is uh, pretty tired today. And my stream keeps kind of going off and on. I've dropped 3.1% of my frames in 43 minutes, which is just horrible, and I don't know why. At any rate, I am Marwat. That is hometown.com. Go and check it out. Become a citizen. There are changes afoot. Stay tuned. See you tomorrow, 6 p.m. Eastern. Bye-bye.